The Night Beat starts right now. Enough is enough. That's the word from neighborhood organizations throughout San Antonio who are now deciding to work together to combat violence. They tell the night team's Camille Juarez that San Antonio needs more collaboration when it comes to addressing violent crime and they want to be involved. Shooting after shooting in San Antonio, sending neighbors over the edge. I think just people, irresponsible people are getting guns and there's do whatever they want, like it's a plaything, like it's a toy. 2022 crime statistics from San Antonio police show homicides rose 12%, assaults increased by 5%, and weapon law violations jumped 37%. Community organizations across the town have agreed they have to enter the conversation. I've never seen the uptick in youth violence, especially with middle school age kids here in our city, and we can no longer turn a blind eye to that. Organizations like Big Mama's House, Rise and Recovery, and Youth for Christ are working together to form their own violence prevention office. Eight organizations, including SAPD, will try to raise San Antonio's Violence Prevention Index, a rating provided to cities by national nonprofit Community Justice Action Fund. It looks at 35 areas that aid public health responses to violence, including firearm regulations, crime reporting, but also employment and health programs. San Antonio scored a low 16 out of 100. I know that our city is unique and will require specific different initiatives that work for our town but we have to start with something and there's already writing on the wall. San Antonio could raise its score by implementing public health strategies like addressing housing and food insecurity and increasing education about guns and mental health. Many of those programs exist but are not working cohesively. We need to unite and have one voice in the city and that's to, to advocate for the safety of our children. The community groups plan to meet consistently, looking at best practices as well as possible funding. They also plan to work with the mayor to form the Community Office of Violence Prevention. Camelia Juarez, KSAT 12 News. The high-profile trial of an Air Force major accused of killing his wife is set to begin next week. Andre McDonald is facing murder and tampering charges in the case. Streaming right now on all of our platforms is an in-depth look at this case. Open court, the trial of Andre McDonald is out now. We take a look at when Andreen McDonald disappeared, the search for her, and then the arrest of Andre McDonald. We also get insight from a local defense attorney about what strategies both the prosecution and defense may use. You can watch this special on KSAT.com, KSAT Plus, or KSAT's YouTube page. page uh, jury selection for Andre McDonald's trial begins on Tuesday. Will friends and neighbors gather to show support for a young mother who had her hands and feet amputated after giving birth? The town of Pleasanton held a barbecue plate fundraiser for Christina Pacheco at St. Andrew's Catholic Church. All profits will help pay for Pacheco's various operations. After delivering her child on October 24th, she was rushed back to the hospital four days later with the rare infection called toxic shock syndrome. Doctors had to amputate her hands and feet to save her life, but her husband Jacob calls her a fighter. But she's keeping her hopes up. She knows she wants to see her babies. Uh, you know, uh, she wants to get home to us, and she's a fighter. She definitely uh, does not want to give up on anything. And uh, it's not going to be uh, a change of life. It's just going to be a different normal. It's just going to be a new normal. The young mother is expected to attend rehab in Houston soon to continue her long road to recovery. It was a blood drive and a party all wrapped up into one. That was the goal of the first ever Sangre Fest on the northwest side today. Today, the South Texas Blood and Tissue teamed up with TikTok account Chunkla Academy to host the blood drive during National Blood Donor Month. There was music, food, prizes for donating. The goal of the drive was to collect 30 donations that can help save the lives of 90 people. The Chancla Academy founder wants people to know that just 3% of the population donates blood every year and growth in areas like South Texas has regularly stranded the blood or strained the blood supply. He hopes this will be the first Sangre Fest of many to come. What better way to use my platform to do it on the west and south side of the area to encourage these people to come out and, and, and save lives. Coronado hopes those who donated blood today continue to donate in the future to help prevent or alleviate shortages in the local and area blood supply. Keeping the beauty alive. Today, volunteers visited the Lake Mitchell Audubon Center to help clean up the wildlife preserve. 
The area serves as home to more than 350 different bird species. It also includes four different kinds of habitats, grasslands, scrublands, wetlands, and woodlands. Volunteers provide all kinds of help to the diverse ecosystem. One example is removing invasive plants to protect, protect the native species. All the wildlife here at Mitchell Lake is um, protected and part of the ecosystem too. So anything from the smallest caterpillar, beetles, all the way up to we see coyotes, raccoons, skunks on night tours. The Audubon Center hopes friends and family will continue volunteering in the new year. If you're interested, fill out the form on our website, ksat.com, just find the story, or you can visit the center on the second Saturday of each month between 8 and 11 a.m. A sorority on the east side of San Antonio is doing its part to help eliminate food insecurity for kids. The local Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority hosted their We Are One Day of service this morning. It was part of the sorority's Childhood Hunger Initiative Power Pack project. The drive serves to help children experiencing food insecurity at Booker T. Washington Elementary. What was collected will be given as weekly food packs for the kids. Organizers say food insecurity is just one of the many issues people are dealing with, but they don't have to face it on their own. There's many families throughout our community facing food insecurity, housing insecurity. We as a community can definitely make a difference if we come together to help. Organizers say they will continue to create and deliver weekly food packs to students at Booker T throughout the year. All right, believe it or not, we are less than one month out from the San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo, and there is a big change this year. Rodeo officials are hosting a qualifier competition in Uvalde rather than having the rodeo be invite only. Yeah, as the night team's Lee Waldman reports, this will allow cowboys and cowgirls to compete who otherwise wouldn't have had the opportunity to win that coveted belt buckle. Valley, Texas. How are you doing? After more than a year of hard work and thousands of volunteers, it's time to saddle up and let the fun begin. To bring the sport of rodeo to anywhere we can, that is really one of our missions. Let kids see it, let everybody see it. It's such a fun event and it's been going on for generations and, and, and decades. Over 800 contestants have been competing since Monday in their events. The top 10 will move on to take part in the San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo. J. Tom Fisher is vying for one of those spots. I think I'm sitting around seventh or eighth, but I'm only about nine tenths of a second out of third. So I feel like if I draw a good steer and make a good run, I can move up quite a bit in the average. On top of being the rodeo's first qualifier event, this event brings the sights and sounds of a big city rodeo to a small community like Uvalde. Rural roots combined with the big uh, pomp and circumstances of a giant urban rodeo like San Antonio, you blend them together and we're going to get a little bit of that tonight. Last year, the San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo gave away over $11 million in scholarships. They hope to do that again this year while also inspiring the next generation of rodeoers. I can sit back and I can say every contestant out there, you had a shot to get into San Antonio, which is the biggest, baddest rodeo in the nation. With sold out stands tonight, this first ever mashup of rural and urban rodeo is already a huge success. The San Antonio Rodeo kicks off in February. Remember, let's rodeo San Antonio. In Uvalde, Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Looks like it was quite a time over in Uvalde today and what great weather to have a rodeo qualifier out there as well. All right, taking a look outside with live cam over the Alamo City this Saturday night. Temperatures in the 50s, so turning cool out there. We are going to see some additional humidity work back in though as we head into the overnight hours. A high temperature of 66 degrees today, so somewhat seasonable out there earlier this afternoon. Again, we're in the mid 50s now. Dew points starting to come up. That's going to be the trend that we find through the overnight hours, leading to some areas of patchy fog first thing tomorrow morning. Still a little chilly. We'll start off in the 40s. Highs head for the mid 70s, and that warming trend continues into the beginning of next week. We'll have all those details coming up here in just a few. Still ahead on the night beat, new cancer research now underway here in the Alamo City. The hope of scientists is the development of a treatment in the form of a pill that is effective and that cancer patients can find easier to tolerate. Plus, health inspectors find more than bread and donuts at a local bakery and market. Roaches and insects making things look a lot less appetizing. We take a look inside at those violations and others when we go behind the kitchen door and severe extreme weather across the country leaving death and destruction behind. We'll tell you in which state people are being told the worst may not be over yet. That's coming up after the break.
All right, in California, more than 25 million people are under flood watches this weekend as heavy rain returns just days after the state was hit by that historic storm. A big mess out there. Meanwhile, in the south, hard hit states are recovering after at least nine people were killed this week when dozens of tornadoes left behind widespread damage. CNN's Gloria Pasmino has more on what's ahead as those survivors begin to pick up the pieces. We are not out of the woods yet. The threat to communities remains and waters will continue to rise even after these storms have passed. Days after California was hit by what the National Weather Service in Los Angeles called the most impressive storm in nearly two decades, the state is now under multiple flood watches. The advisory is in effect for more than 25 million people. It's taking into account all of the rain that has fallen. When you look at some of these cities, Reno, Sacramento, San Francisco, Santa Barbara, all of them have had roughly six months of rain in just two short weeks. This weekend, winter storm warnings are in place across the Sierras where three to six feet of snow are possible through Monday. In the south, Alabama Governor Kay Ivey toured Selma on Friday, so one of the hardest hit areas in the state. Dozens of tornadoes were reported across the region, leaving behind a trail of damage and destruction in the southeast. At least nine people were killed, seven of them in Alabama. Well, a glimpse <laughs> was very revealing. It was far worse than anything I had envisioned or seen on television. There's a lot of work to be done here. I'm Gloria Pasmino reporting. Rough start to the new year yeah. weather-wise so far. Here it's been quiet, it's continued to be dry, yeah. but a little bit cooler weather, for, yeah. finally. Mm -hmm. That's nice, then a little bit of a break in the humidity yes. too. It does help when you do step outside, but yes, I wish it would be able to muster up at least a little bit of rain, no flooding or severe weather or anything like that. Unfortunately, over the next several days, we don't have any big substantial chances for widespread rain. Just the middle of next week, when we'll see a weak front move through, that could spark a few isolated showers here in and around the San Antonio area, maybe a few scattered showers the farther east that you go. But before we can get there, it is going to be a drier into the weekend. However, a little bit more moisture is going to work back in over the next 12 to 24 hours, which essentially means we'll have the potential to find some patchy fog out there tomorrow morning and into Monday morning as well. Temperatures are also going to increase for the back half of the weekend's plans. We were in the mid 60s today here in San Antonio. How about the mid 70s as we head into our Sunday afternoon? Those temperatures will continue to build into the first half of next week before we see that next front move through and spark up that small chance for a couple showers on Wednesday. Temperatures right now a little cool out there. 56 over at the airport, 53 in Bull Verde, 54 at Converse, 52 in Hondo, 53 up in Bandera. Now still relatively drier air in place right now, but those dew points have started to rise. And you can see, especially across our far southeastern counties and even closer to the coast, that's where more of that moisture is already starting to move farther north Word. That's going to be the trend that we see continue through the overnight hours and through our Sunday as well as those south winds just pump in a little bit more of that humidity. So this isn't perfect here, but notice on your future cast in terms of visibility tomorrow. Yes, some of that could be limited and reduced in spots if we can find some of that patchy fog to form. Just something to think about if you are stepping out early Sunday morning that then looks to break up as we head into the mid morning hours. Temperature wise, not as cold as what we woke up to earlier this morning and yesterday morning, but you still will want the extra layer stepping out the door tomorrow as we will wake up to temperatures in the 40s across a good portion of the area around 44 in Bull Verde, 43 up in Bernie, 41 in Utopia and 43 over in Divine. As we see the sun come up, those temperatures then start to warm. We're near about 64 by 11 a.m. upper 60s as we head into the lunchtime hour and then those daytime highs about five Five to 10 degrees warmer than where we were earlier this afternoon in the mid 70s for your Sunday. Something else I will think that you'll notice heading into tomorrow, a gusty south wind sustained at about 10 to 20 miles per hour, gusting upwards of 25 to 30 miles per hour. That will subside just a little bit as we head into our MLK day on Monday. Still though, with that moisture in place, some areas of patchy fog, certainly possible Monday morning. Notice 
this year temperature is still on that upward trend. We're in the mid 50s waking up Monday morning afternoon highs already near about 80 and we'll see that continue into Wednesday as well. What we'll look to find though Monday evening a week front. A weak little boundary is going to try and move into at least part of our area before it stalls. Not expecting any rain with this one, unfortunately, just maybe a little bit of drier air, especially across our far northwestern counties. Temperatures still warmer than average into Tuesday. There's that next front that moves in on Wednesday. That will allow temperatures to fall into the low 70s by the second half of next week and maybe a few showers heading into Wednesday, guys. All right, sounds good. Nice dress, Mia. Thanks, Courtney. You too. <laughs> okay. It's it's not the exact same, but it's close. It's pretty. Close. We are twinning. The boys didn't get the message. Well, I left my red dress at home tonight. Oh, no, why? Red dress. <laughs> why? Why would you? I almost wore my red tie, Larry. You, you've got the memo. You're wearing maroon pants. Yep. See. All right, the Cowboys haven't exactly inspired a lot of confidence going into the playoffs. No, they sure haven't, Tim. You know, you hear teams say they want to have that positive momentum going into the playoffs, but the Dallas Cowboys certainly don't have that due to their last game. And because of that, is Dak worried heading to Tampa? And the Niners rolled today behind Mr. Irrelevant. Coming up. not re really who you know is favored or not favored it's who plays the best so um, yeah it's I never really paid attention to those things uh, I just try to go play the best I can Tom Brady is a home playoff underdog for the first time in his 23 year NFL career in big board sports pro football coverage powered by Davis law firm NFL wildcard weekend kicked off today with the Seattle Seahawks at the San Francisco 49ers first quarter second to goal Niners at the three rookie QB Brock Purdy Mr. Irrelevant with time to throw steps up and finds Christian McCaffrey three yard touchdown and the Niners go up 10 to nothing. Second quarter now, Seahawks are down six, third and three at the 50 when Geno Smith hits DJ Metcalf in stride. 50 yard score in the Seahawks first lead of the game, 14-13. They led 17-16 at halftime, but the Niners would dominate the second half. Purdy fakes the toss, rolls out and throws to the dangerous Debo Samuel, and he works his magic down the sideline with his teammates blocking. That's a 74 yard touchdown and put this one out of reach, 38-17. The Niners roll 41-23. Purdy winning his NFL playoff debut, passing for 330 two yards, three touchdowns, and no turnovers. You can just feel it, you know, in the environment with the fans and um, our teammates. Like, man, this is win or, or go home. And so, um, you know, you did feel that. I feel like pregame and whatnot. But once the game started, it was all, hey, it's 11 on 11. I got to do my job. I got to get it to the guys. The Niners advance to the divisional round where they will host either Minnesota, Tampa Bay, or Dallas next weekend. In the AFC wildcard playoffs, the LA Chargers are playing at the Jacksonville Jaguars right now, and the Chargers lead 30 to 28 late in the fourth quarter. The Jags were once down 27 to nothing late in the second quarter, and so far they are outplaying the Chargers in the second half. NFL Super Wildcard Weekend will wrap up Monday night when the Dallas Cowboys visit the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the last of six wildcard games and Dallas is favored by two and a half points. The boys finished the regular season 12 and five and second in the NFC East behind the Eagles in the regular season finale with a chance to still win the NFC East. The boys lost 26 to six at the commanders. Now the Eagles won that same day wrapping up the division. So the Cowboys score really didn't matter in the end, but to some the way they played does matter heading into the postseason. Six points was their second lowest output of the season. The Dak was asked that that will bother him Monday night in Tampa. Yeah, I've been able to put it behind me. Um, as you just said, when something's uncharacteristic, uh, it's about getting back and doing the things that, that you know um, who you are, and that's the study and that's the preparation. Um, that's making sure I'm doing the thing, um, everything I need to mentally uh, to leave no doubt that um, I respond the right way, and that's really uh, all I know how to do. So, uh, yeah, that's behind me, to be honest what, with what you. As Cowboys fans know, Bucks QB Tom Brady has never lost to their team. He's a perfect 7-0. That's 5-0 with the Patriots and now 2-0 with Tampa Bay. In total, he's passed for 1,945 yards with 15 touchdowns versus Dallas. Brady and the Bucks beat the boys 19-3 back in week one, and he liked the way their offense played that day. You got to stay balanced and you got to run the ball well. I thought one thing we did really well against the first time we played was we ran the ball really well. And that alleviated a lot of pressure from the passing game. And I think the teams that are playing well now do run the ball pretty well. And, um, you know, we're going to have to do it. But they got some good players. They got 
some very athletic linebackers, obviously a very good D-line. Um, so it's, it's tough. It's going to be a big challenge. Monday's game will mark the first time Brady will face the Cowboys in the playoffs. Kick is Monday night, 7-15 here on KSAT 12, and we will be there. Buffalo Bills safety DeMar Hamlin visited his teammates at the Bills facility just 12 days after going into cardiac arrest during Monday night football. Bills linebacker Matt Milano posted this photo on his Instagram account today of a smiling Hamlin shaking hands with someone at the facility. That is so great to see. Spurs Dub McDermott was in awe of all the Spurs legends at the Dome last night. We've got that later in sports. A lot of familiar faces and big names there last night. <laughs> yeah, Thank indeed. you, Larry. It was incredible. All right, coming up, how far should employers go when it comes to respecting their workers' religious beliefs? That question, up for the Supreme Court to decide. Plus, fighting multiple types of cancer with just one pill. We'll explain the groundbreaking research happening right here in San Antonio when the night beat continues. There is a new cancer research study being conducted right here in San Antonio. Now the hope is to help people battering different forms of cancer with just a pill. Jonathan Cotto explains researchers at the Start Center for Cancer Care aim to have a treatment that is tolerable, manageable, and effective. Over time, scientists have discovered several mutations and abnormalities in tumors which make them grow. The challenge has been to find so-called targeted drugs to try and stop these mutations. Dr. Papadopoulos is the principal investigator for the Adagrassive study at Start Center. The study we have been involved with um, essentially was testing one of these drugs um, in patients with a mutation called KRAS, which is very common in a variety of tumors. He says there has been very encouraging data that shows Crizati, the new drug, is also effective in treating colon cancer. Participating and uh, developing the drug to the stage where it could then move on and be available to a a whole host of patients. The trials have involved several hundred patients with different malignancies across several countries. The advance has been to show that these drugs are effective in these patients with this variant of KRAS. KRAS G12C is an oncogenic driving mutation in different types of cancers. Historically, researchers have not been able to find a way to stop the rapid cell growth. But this study drug has at least one patient hopeful. So we started it and kind of talked through it, worked through it for the first six months, and then we were like, hey, it's working really good. So here we are a little over a year and a half, and it's still working. Howard's journey with cancer began in 2020. He has metastatic colorectal cancer with the KRAS G12C mutation. I'm happy to be a guinea pig for this so that other people won't have to go through the, you know, tough trials and tribulations that I've done to get to this point. Jonathan Cotto. KSAT 12 News. The accused shooter of the Colorado LGBTQ club is now facing additional charges in that massacre. The gunman faces an additional 12 counts of attempted murder and hate crimes, bringing the total to 317. The suspect opened fire into a crowd at Club Q in Colorado Springs on November 19th of the last year, killing five and wounding 19. The gunman faces life in prison without parole. Their next court appearance is scheduled for February. Well, more than $5 billion in cash and other liquid assets have been recovered from the failed cryptocurrency firm FTX. A lawyer for the failed company says those assets may be used to help repay creditors. The recovery is significant, considering last month FTX lawyers submitted documents showing the company and its affiliates had a total of $1.2 billion in cash. FTX co-founder Sam Bankman-Fried pleaded not guilty to eight federal counts of fraud and conspiracy. The U.S. Supreme Court is deciding how far employers must go in respecting their workers' religious beliefs. On Friday, the high court chose to hear a dispute after the case of Gerald Groff. Groff is a mail carrier from Pennsylvania who sued the U.S. Postal Service for making him work on Sundays. Identifying as a Christian, he quit in 2019, saying he prefers dedicating that day to worship. A U.S. District Court already ruled last year that ex excusing Groff from work on Sundays would cause undue hardships to the USPS. Federal law states companies have to accommodate employees' religious beliefs unless they cause said undue hardships. We'll keep an eye on that one. 
Well, yesterday was Friday the 13th, but for one specific person, that day will never be associated with bad luck. That's because someone in Lebanon, Maine, won $1.35 billion with their Mega Millions ticket. The ticket was sold at a gas station in Lebanon. That's between Boston and Portland. The owner of the gas station says when the lottery commission called to tell him he sold the winning ticket, he thought it was a scam. He says everyone is asking him if he knows who the winner is. His answer is no, but says that Lebanon is a small rural community. So this winning ticket will be, quote, really good news for somebody. Behind the kitchen door brings us to a bakery where the sweets were covered in insects and others things, as well as a Chinese buffet that scored even lower the second time health inspectors visited. We'll go there right after this.